I want you to open your Bible. Uh, Ephesians 4 is where we're going to be. Ephesians 4, and we're going to look at the latter part of a couple of verses we looked at last week. So there's kind of an exclamation point. If you're here with us, Paul has been talking about what to put on, what to put off, and we're going to see that again today. But let me begin with this. Many of you remember it was 2015 uh, when a self-proclaimed white supremacist came into a Bible study at a church in Charleston. I've been to that church. I've met with those who were there on this day in 2015. They welcomed him into a small group Bible study down the basement of the AME church. And then he opened fire, fatally killed nine people there, shocked the world. These kind of events are becoming way too normative, it seems. May they never be. And what shocked the world later is when the family members of the victims who were taken away from them stood before this young man and said, I forgive you. I'm a follower of Jesus, and I forgive you. The same thing happened closer to home. You remember in 2018 when Botham Jean was in his apartment eating ice cream. An Amber Geiger off-duty police officer who thought it was her apartment came in, shot him fatally. And then a year later, his brother shocked the world by coming into the courtroom and asking the judge if he could speak to Amber Geiger and he forgave her and he said, can I hug her? And he walked up, he hugged her. Many watched in both of these incidents, many watched and wept, amazed at that kind of grace. Others watched with anger. How could someone forgive someone for something like that? And yet, again, here goes another case where a black person is having to, to forgive a white person is how the narrative was running. And then others still were saying, that's not forgiveness at all. Still others were saying, you cannot forgive a heinous act like that. That's unforgivable. These kinds of moments cause all of us to think again, what is forgiveness? And, and must we choose between forgiveness and justice? Today we're going to answer three questions. The first, when do we forgive? The second, the hard work, how do we forgive? And then the third, why? Why? Do we forgive? And we find it all here in the text. And I want you with your Bible open now. Everyone, if you don't have your Bible, um, I want you to, to find a Bible in the pew rack there in front of you. And can I say this? Um, I love you as your pastor. Let me get in. I want you in on my little angst I sense. I think we're creating, in some ways, lazy listeners. I'm tempted to just remove the scripture from the screens. Because some, I can see you. I can see you right now. You know this, right? <laughs> Love you. Let's dive into the word. Bring your Bible every Sunday. Bring a journal. You're, we're reading scripture together. This is the word of God. Amen? So let's bring your Bible now. And yes, lots of grace. It's on the screen. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as, just as God in Christ forgave you. All right, if you take notes, here we go. When do we forgive? Now, the quick answer is all our lives and over and over again. But what I'm going to challenge us to do is think deeply about this. 
throughout this entire sermon. And the way to apply this, this gets real tender for some of us. Think about someone you need to forgive. You're going to find underneath this layers of attitudes that we may have that can lead to anger or a sense of unforgiveness and and issues in our relationships. There's much to apply here today. I'm going to, just as I have been praying, praying for the Spirit to move, if your heart is open, to speak into your heart today. He will say things that I may not say audibly, right? In verse 30, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. We forgive, you saw how this lands, we forgive because we are forgiven people. I could close the sermon there. Why forgive? Because you're forgiven. Let's go. Let's go forgive. Yeah, but, wait a minute, really? Is it that easy? It's not that easy. But if we are first, in the context of it all, we are walking in step with the Spirit, keeping in pace with the Spirit of God, we're sealed for the day of redemption. We know who we are. Our identity has been changed. We are a forgiven people, totally loved, fully accepted by him. We say it often. Now go forgive. We forgive because we do not want to grieve the Holy Spirit to make God sad with the gift that he's given to us. So we're walking in communion with the Spirit, in unity with the Spirit, and so we forgive. But let's define this. Let's define forgiveness. One of the things I've, I've, I've learned has helped me a lot, and I've studied this a lot through the years, sought to practice it in my own life. Lewis Smedes wrote a book, and if you're curious, I'm going to rattle off a few books that you may want to dive deeper into. Uh, you can email my office. We'll get them to you. Lewis Smedes wrote a book called The Art of Forgiveness. He also wrote a book called Forgive and Forget. Uh, David Augsburger wrote a great book called The Freedom of Forgiveness, and the late, great Tim Keller, his last book was entitled simply Forgive, an excellent book. There's much work that we need to do, all of us, and perhaps more than we know. But what I've discovered that has helped me, and Smeeds helps me here, uh, we need to understand what forgiveness is not in order to really understand what we're doing when we forgive. He points out first that we, we first we forgive persons. Now, this may seem odd. Of course, who else are we going to forgive? He's noting we forgive people who have directly hurt us or wronged us. And he would add who have, who have seriously wronged us. I'll talk about that in a moment. We are so easily offended in our day, right? Not all things that happen to you demand forgiveness. You might just need to get over it. And a lot of people are trying to train us and teach us, aren't we supposed to be angry about everything? No. Not if you're a disciple of Jesus. We show the world a better way. But his point is, you don't just forgive groups of people. You don't just, well, I don't like that. I don't like that football team. I'm going to forgive them for beating our team. No. It's someone who's done something to you. And he would argue, I'm not sure I'm quite here. He would say, you can only forgive someone who has done you wrong. Now, think about this. If you're like me, I can think of incidents where people have hurt people that I love greatly, deeply. Do I need to forgive that person? Did they sin against me? That's worth parsing out. And if it's family and, well, kind of then there probably is a, here's the word, a release. You're going to hear that word over and over again. Forgiving is releasing. And we'll talk about that. People who offend us or wound us, not offend, but wound us, hurt us seriously, we need to forgive them. Now, we live, again, in an easily offendable culture. In fact, another book I'd point you to, Brant Hansen wrote a book called unoffendable and he is he makes the case and it's strong that as Christians we should be unoffendable think about that if my if my worth is secure I am totally forgiven I know who I am in Christ I'm not trying to gain your approval I'm not trying to convince you necessarily of anything I don't have to prove that I'm right 
I'm unoffendable. I can roll with the punches. I can continue to love. How freeing is that? It, it is, it's so freeing. When you have nothing to prove, you're unoffendable. This is who we are. We can live in a different way. Gang, this message gets to the heart of grace, which is why this message is going to be and is so radical to apply and difficult to apply. When do we forgive? Do we forgive when, when, when another has, has not repented? Do we forgive when, do we wait for them to come groveling to us, to, to get down on your knees? Think about it. Let, let's, let's unpack this a bit more. How about when I can't forget what they've done? Does that mean I haven't forgiven them? Because that's happened too, right? And the greater the sin against us, the more we're likely to recycle that. Maybe it's been years, but it keeps coming back. Does that mean you haven't forgiven them? Not necessarily. And we'll, we'll see that today as well. Does it mean the relationship is restored? Not always. I have talked to many, and often it's in marriage, where there's been uh, infidelity or an unfaithful spouse. And I've sat with the spouse. Often it's the wife, but not always. I just last week talked to a man whose wife has been unfaithful. And we're talking about forgiveness. What does that look like? And here's what I've learned through the years. I'll have a wife that'll tell me, Jeff, but I'm telling you, he's so remorseful. I mean, he's, he's we, he was weeping. I don't see him cry much. He was crying. Like, he was really, really brokenhearted. And you all know I'm a man of grace. But I have learned over the years, of course, he's, he's crying. He got caught. And here's, here's, here's what I've learned. I don't care what he says. Watch what he does. Because if he really wants to restore a relationship like that, he will, if he's truly repentant, he will do whatever you tell him to do. Yes, perhaps with a trained therapist, with someone who can help you, got what are the steps? But he will, I want your phone. Here's, here's my phone. I want to see everybody you've been texting. Here, you can see everything. I want to see your computer. I want it. I want all the information. Here it is. You can see everything. I want to know where you are all the time. Really? Wow. Now you're the new master of my life. How serious are you? See, actions prove that you're repentant. Because some relationships, emotional, physical abuse, do not need to be restored until the person has changed. Smeeds writes this, to be a qualified forgiver, you must be the person who was done wrong. He says forgiving is an affair strictly between the victim and the victimizer. Everyone else should step aside. I'm not sure I agree with that completely because there have been times, again, Someone who's hurt someone I love, I think there is a sense of forgiveness, release. Let's talk about what that looks like. What does that mean? When do I forgive? Matthew 18, Jesus says this. Then Peter came up to him, you perhaps know this passage, and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I will forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 Seven times, or 70 times seven. And this seems to contradict even the scripture we read earlier in the service. I think Peter is coming forward. He's saying what was normal three times, times two plus one, we get seven. That's a perfect number. Perhaps Peter is saying, I think I'm understanding your teaching. Is it seven times? Like Peter always wanting to be, you know, the, the star student. And Jesus, again, blows his mind like he does all of us. Lord, is it like seven? That's like the perfect, that's a lot of forgiveness towards someone. Jesus says 70 times. He doesn't mean 490 times. He means over and over again. 
How radical is this? But there's a nuance here. And the nuance is this. When someone has hurt you, it will continue to come back in your minds and you, in your mind, and you can say, I forgive them. I have released them, and we'll talk about this. I've released them from a need for justice, my punishment, for them to just hurt and come groveling to me. I'm releasing that because the Lord says in Deuteronomy 32, 35, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He is the one who's just. We often think of righteous anger. I could argue that no, not one of us has righteous anger. Not really. There is that. But the Lord is the judge of it all. So we release them. The nuance is you, when, when you think about them, you release them again and again. You continue to forgive. And here's, here, at the end of the day, it's this. Forgiveness is an act of faith. That's it, isn't it? It's an act of faith that God is just. He is loving. He's the one who can, can receive this person. I don't have to play God anymore. That will make you crazy, by the way as we'll see here as we unpack this a bit more. But as it comes back into your mind, we continue to forgive them over and over again. It's like grief. Grief comes in waves. It'll come back to you. Even forgiveness, there's an aspect of grief. You've been hurt, and it brings that pain back around. Time helps, but we say it this way. In, in, in grief, time doesn't heal anything. The Spirit of God heals and the Spirit of God leads us only by the power of the Spirit can we forgive and live like this. Clara Barton, who founded the Red Cross, was asked about a vicious deed that was done to her years before, and she acted like she had forgotten it. When she was pressed a little bit further, Clara Barton said this, I remember distinctly choosing to forget that. She's saying, I, I remember clearly, I have forgiven that person and released them, and I'm releasing them, in a sense, over and over again because I've already, I've already forgiven them. My point is, you can't always forget, but that doesn't mean that you haven't forgiven. It means that you are thinking again, and it's an opportunity. How about that? To grow deeper in grace. So it's this, forgiveness is preemptive and perpetual. Preemptive grace means I'm living in a state of grace. I am forgiven, I am ready to forgive. I've said it, to, I say it to couples all the time. Marriage is the union between two good forgivers. If you can't do that, you're in trouble. So we live in this constant state of readiness. Only forgiveness breaks the chain of ungrace. And this is how we're called to live. There's another aspect of when. Again, do I forgive when they come groveling to me? Do I, I, do I forgive them when they finally have paid the price for their sin? Do I, do I forgive them when they've walked through all the steps and then I'll forgive? None of those. Friends, listen. Forgiveness is not a law of reciprocity. Grace is not the law. And this, again, is a radical way to live. The maddening quality of forgiveness is that it's unfair. And when we recognize how we've been forgiven, we praise him. Here it is. When we forgive... We're telling the story of grace. That's what we're doing. So how do we forgive? Here's the hard work. How do we forgive? Well, it's a process, but like grief, it's a process, but it's not a step-by-step -step process. There's the elements here, and Paul gives us some help. Because this may be the unforeseen gift. This hit me this week. The unforeseen gift of needing to forgive someone, even needing forgiveness, is an opportunity to grow in grace. And isn't that what we all need and really desire when we're at our best? I want to grow deeper to understand his love for me and to apply it to my life. So he says, you're going to have to take off some things 
in order to forgive. You see him here. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Let's unpack these for a moment because they're helpful. See if we don't do this. Bitterness, okay, this word describes cruelty, and it was used um, of a slave owner punishing a slave. It was, it was used for one who has, has to, wants others to suffer in humane ways. This is what unforgiveness is. We want the other person to pay the price, don't we? Because we want to be, watch this, we want to be the ones who determine the punishment and the degree of the punishment. We want to be the master over their punishment. What do we do with that? Release. This is hard work, but it can be done. We release our need for punishing the other person. You release it. Say, I, I'm going to let that go. I'm, it's an act of faith. I'm going to leave that to God. Grace would say, and, and hey, if the Lord wants to bless them, then he can bless them. I'm releasing that for my good. Rage is the next word. I say rage because there's two words here, wrath and anger, and together I think it's rage. And if bitterness is seeking to control the punishment, then rage is resentment that's out of control. And this can eat you alive, by the way, if not dealt with. See, we, we want to make forgiveness a law of reciprocity, but never really at the same level. You may be prone to this in relationships, maybe again in marriage, but in close relationships. Maybe it's somebody makes you crazy at work. Often you get into a conversation or there's messages sent that hurt me what you just said or what you just did. I'm going to come back with a little bit, a little bit of something, but it's never quite equal. It's a little more. And if you raise your voice, I'm going to raise mine a little higher. That's what happens in relationships. What do you do with that? You take a break. You might literally need, if you're prone towards that, you may, I need, I need to step away. Can we talk about this later? And as we talked about last week, don't let, don't let the sun go down on your anger. But I'm, I'm going to, I'm, uh, I'm about to say something, in essence, is what you're saying. And I will be the one that needs forgiveness. I'm going to step away. But we will get back to this. The next word is clamor. This is literally um, raising your voice. This is shout is what it means, outcry. Because what happens in, in, in our relationships, we do. We get angry and then we can raise our voice. And some of you, let me just say this. If you're prone to doing this in relationships and in marriage, close relationships, it needs to end. You can deal with that. Because sometimes it continues to escalate and then louder and louder becomes physical and then we have real problems. And if you need help with that today, if you're a victim of that, we want to talk to you before you go home. Contact our offices. What do you do with that? Watch this. Turn your shouting into prayer. Who does this? Disciples of Jesus. Jesus did this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Turn your shouting into prayer. And it might be literally that. If you are alone or find yourself, maybe it's in your car, maybe it's locked away in a closet somewhere, away from everybody else, shout it out with God. It may be a real healing kind of thing for you. Again, we've said it. Weeping prayer is a powerful way to prayer. Crying out to God. He's big enough for that, friends. He says, come to me with all that you have. The next word is slander. Now, most of us know what this is. And we do this when we've been done wrong. Slander is to say something untrue about the other person. The literal word here is blaspheme. It's the same word. But here's what we do. We do it in the form of exaggeration. 
Let the Spirit convict any of us here today. We say things, we exaggerate perhaps what they've done. We defame them and we talk to people who will agree with us because it makes us feel better. So good, we have a jury now who's claiming this person really did hurt me, though I did exaggerate a little bit. But still, they have hurt me. Now you're on my side. That's what we want to do. But slander can come in smaller forms as well. In the church, we call them prayer requests. Y'all listen, I want y'all to pray for him because he's done this and this and this. I mean, pray for him, but he did this and he's done this and he, he is like this. He's messed up. Oh, but would you pray for him? Y'all, um, I've been praying for her and I want you to join me because she has done this and this and this and this. Listen, do not be an instrument of disunity in the body. That's slander. Pray for them. And if it's something that needs to be kept private, then pray for them only with trusted people, if at all, with others. Malice is the last word. This is the intention to do harm to someone. Now, we understand this in the legal system. This is the difference between manslaughter and murder. Murder is with an intent to kill. Manslaughter is not. Those are different things. When you have an intent for the other person to be hurt at least as much as you've been hurt, it's not forgiveness. So how do you know? How do you know if you have malice towards another person? It's when something happens to them and you say, good. Something happens to the other person and you say, they deserve that. And you say, well, isn't there justice? Isn't there that? When you say good to the harm of another person, malice has poisoned your heart. And again, this creates all kinds of questions because this is a radical way to live. To be lived defined by grace and to extend grace to others is a radical way to live and it is the best way to live. We forgive all the time and often perpetually and preemptively. We we forgive when we get rid of these things but it's not enough just to get rid of. Now he's going to say, here's why we forgive. Why do we forgive? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. As God in Christ forgave you. Now he says, put these things on. Instead of lashing out when someone comes at us, we're kind. We meet anger with kindness. Are you serious? Who does this? When someone offends us or hurts us, we are tenderhearted toward them. Who, who does this? Jesus. Oh yeah, but that's Jesus. I mean, I'll never be like Jesus. You are a disciple of Jesus who is being shaped to become just like him. Here it is. We forgive because we have been forgiven. This is it. This is what it all comes down to. We forgive because we have been forgiven. How have we been forgiven then is the question. Unconditionally, preemptively, while we were yet sinners, what does it say? Christ died for us before we ever turned to him. How do we forgive? If we're to forgive like him, how do we forgive? By dying. That's it. By dying. When you decided to be a disciple of Jesus, you answered the call. Jesus said, if you want to come after me, anyone, then what does he say? Let him deny himself. What? Take up, are y'all with me? Take up his cross and follow me. Here's my point. What did you think you were getting into? Or have you decided that discipleship is something other than it is biblical? 
You see, we step into it. I have already decided to die to myself, to my need for justice, for my need to get, uh, to, to get revenge, to come back at the other person. I've already died. Forgiveness is dying even to my right to be right. Dying is now, I will allow the Lord Jesus, I'll allow the Father, the perfect judge, to be sovereign over this situation. Helmut Thielich was the German theologian who lived through the horrors of, of Nazism. And he wrote this. I was so moved by this years ago. This business of forgiving is by no means a simple thing. We say, very well, if the other fellow is sorry and begs my pardon, I will forgive him. Then I'll give in. We make forgiveness a law of reciprocity. And it never works. For then, both of us say to ourselves, the other fellow has to make the first move. And then I watch like a hawk to see whether the other person will flash the signal to me with his eyes or or whether uh, I can detect some small hint between the lines of his letter which shows me that he's sorry. And then he writes this, I'm always on the point of forgiving, but I never forgive. I am too just. We must die to our need for retribution and and revenge. We must release ourselves from the throne of judgment upon others because we have a God that we trust. And for some of us, it begins with forgiving ourselves. That we would embrace the grace of God and that we would receive his grace. C.S. Lewis wrote this, I think that if God forgives us, we must forgive ourselves. Otherwise, it is almost like setting up ourselves as a higher tribunal than him. Have you received his grace? Why do we forgive? Because in the end, after all the hard work of forgiveness has been done, we genuinely forgive and we set a prisoner free. And then we realize the person we set free is ourselves. We've been released to love again. As we sang about earlier, we've been released to experience joy again. To actually live again. And friends, today is the day for some of us. Today is the day. The word forgiveness in the New Testament literally means to hurl away, to toss away. It means to release. And so what I want to do is land this sermon in prayer to do the hard work now. You've been thinking through this. I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Because Jesus says if you forgive, then your father will forgive you. And he's very explicit. If you do not forgive, your father will not forgive you. What does this mean? No one will ever stand before God someday and say, I forgave a bunch of people, so now you forgive me. It's not what he's saying. He's saying your ability to forgive another, to do the hard work of forgiveness, is proof that you have been forgiven. And if you cannot It is proof that you have not received his grace. So today is your day. Friend, right where you are, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, receive his forgiveness. Maybe this sermon has helped you to get underneath it all and realize he has forgiven you in ways you've never imagined. Receive his forgiveness. Say yes to him. Thank him for it. And then allow your life to be one big response to all that he's done in you. Receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior doesn't mean that all things will go well with you now. 
It means that you get him and whatever you go through. He is with you. He will never leave you. And he is making you into the person you've been created to be. You can praise him. You can forgive. So what will you do? I want you to just say, Lord, I, I'm going to release this person. I receive your grace and I extend it to them. And Lord, we thank you that on Calvary, you broke up the log jam between justice and forgiveness. And on the cross, your inflexible holiness and justice collided with your grace and undying love for us and our salvation was made possible. And you have set us free. So we give you our lives to do the hard work of forgiveness so that we can become who you've created us to be. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.